Malachi chapter number two, we're going to start in verse number 17. It says this, you have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's, fi a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner. And do not, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have uh, turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me. Go and say, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. We're going to go over to verse number 16. Verse 16 says this. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasure possession and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Come on, can we just thank God for his word in this moment? Come on, we're a house built on the word of God. I love, I love this book. I love this book. Uh, just let's look at chapter four. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. So shall it, it will leave them neither uh, root or branch, but for you who fear my name, the sun, this is good stuff, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall and you shall tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. I'm going to try to unpack that um, somewhat. And I encourage you to go back and read it and ask the Lord what it means to you as you study it this week. But let's pray. God, we pray in the name of Jesus. So much is at stake today. Families, marriages, uh, uh, jobs, Lord God, people's finances, Lord, our country. As we observe 9-11, we go back uh, 17 years, God, when our whole world changed. And God, we pray for the United States of America, God. We ask you, God, that you would heal the division. Heal, O oh God, and bring us together in unity. We are so polarized, O oh God. I pray, Lord, that you would send, and I hope you're agreeing with me on this, Send a revival, God. Pour out your spirit on America. Have mercy upon us, O oh God. May, we, may you send your spirit to bring conviction of sin. Lord, that your people would, would repent, God, and that we would align ourselves, Lord, with you. That we would no longer rebel against you as a nation, aborting our babies, uh, uh, Lord, killing one another, racism, Lord, violence against police, God, all of these things we pray, God, that we would experience the God of heaven, the kingdom of God, to come on earth as it is in heaven. So, God, we pray that you would illuminate this word to us. And, Lord, as, as we approach this anniversary of 9-11, wake us up because you're coming back again. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. All right, today, today I'm just going to try to summarize what, what Caleb has just read in Malachi 
We're calling, I'm calling this the comeback to anticipating his comeback. And it's important that we renew a sense of anticipation for the second coming of Christ. We're coming back to anticipating his comeback. How many of you know that Jesus is coming back again? As surely as he came the first time, he is coming again. Is that right? Are you cold? The only advantage that the cold has for me today is that you will probably stay awake. But we're gonna, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure it's not that this cold again. Uh, pray for our, pray, let's pray for our town for it real quick. God, we thank you for this town of Plymouth. We thank you for the DPW workers. We thank you for providing this building. God, help us to just love them and show our appreciation to them. We want to have, we want to continue to have such a great, as we already have a friendly relationship with, we pray you'd bless our town, bless these workers, bless our, bless the, all of the town workers, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> two, two main points I'm going to make today is why we anticipate. Why do we anticipate? Number one, the first reason is he came and he's coming back again. And, and we'll look at that. Second one is his coming is good and bad news. So those are the two points. He came, he's coming back again. And then second point, his coming will bring good and bad news. All right, so let, let's, let's kind of focus on the first one. But what I want to do first is I want you to realize that this is basically a question that the Israelites have and an answer that God gives. And here's the question. Let's boil it down. We're going to edit a lot. Here's a question they have. First of all, they're thinking it seems like God is okay with evil because they get away with it. You see, they're experiencing, they're seeing a lot of evil. They themselves are perpetuating evil. What did we just talk about last week? The injustice that men were, were bringing by leaving and abandoning, divorcing their wives, by sending them away. It's really what they did is they sent them away. And back then, women didn't have resources. So if they were divorced by their husbands, they could starve to death. They would be vulnerable to violence. And even in some cases, it seems to be that God is saying, you've committed violence against your wives. And here's what God says about violence. He says, I hate violence. There's no place for a Christian to ever think that you ever are given the right to ever hurt somebody violently. It is against the Bible. It's against what Jesus taught. And so uh, G God is really, really advocating against violence here toward the, the innocent, toward the innocent. So anyways, we're coming off of that section, right? And now he's, they're, they're basically so like dispassionate and apathetic and and, and, the, and listen, it, our view of God is going to shape whether we have passion for him and live for him or whether we could just give a rip. Have you ever been at the give a rip stage? I could just give a rip. You know what give a rip is, right? I just don't care. Anybody been at the I could give a rip stage? And how many of you have been cur uh, converted to I do give a rip and I want to live wholeheartedly for Jesus? Are you, are you at that place? Okay, so... Uh, that's where they were, and they said, where is the God of justice? Where is, the, where is God with all this stuff going on? The surrounding neighbors were trying to stop the work, and, and they hated the Jews, and they were coming against them. Where's the God of justice? Where's the God of justice? Chapter 3, verse 1. Did you see the answer? Did you see the answer? He said, behold, I send my messenger by the way, that was fulfilled. This is a prophecy written 400 years before Christ. I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Who's that? Who fulfilled that in the New Testament? John the Baptist, Matthew 11, Jesus said, that speaks of John the Baptist and he came. And what did he do? He prepared the way of the Lord. He came Boldly, I mean, the dude was covered with camel skin. He was eating locusts and honey. How many of you know that's not your average person? But yet, because he didn't care. He just 
was, had been in, in the desert with the Lord. He had been praying and he knew God's will. And the Holy Spirit came upon him and he spoke with boldness. And people came to hear him speak. And they were repenting for their sins. And the first words out of his mouth is, repent, repent. And they were making the, getting themselves right with God. So here's the fulfillment of what Malachi prophesied 400 years. John the Baptist came. I'll send my messenger. He'll prepare the way before him. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now who's that? Who, what was the fulfillment? Who, who fulfilled that? Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. He's, he's, he's answering the question. You're saying, where's the God of justice? He's coming. He's coming. The Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord. And 400 years later, a baby was born in Bethlehem in a manger. And he grew up to become a man. And when he turned 30, John the Baptist, his cousin, as he was baptizing, he says, behold, the Lamb of God, and he pointed to Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was announced to the world. The Messiah, who is God the Son, came to save his people from their sins. And he was going to come in power. And he spoke with authority. And people even trembled. You know, he was so powerful. The disciples even were terrified because he spoke with such authority and he could speak and the winds and the waves obeyed him. Jesus came. He was the one that Malachi prophesied about. So he came. And so this is the answer to their question, where is the God of justice? He said, don't worry, he's coming. Now then, here we are. He came. How many of you know? He came. Did he come? Of course he came. But now, listen, is he coming back again? Ask your, the person next to you, is he coming back again? Now somebody give the answer to that question up in the balconies. Of course he's coming back again. I want to tell you something. There were 300 prof over 300 prophecies written in the Old Testament before Jesus came. And they specifically told us in detail what would happen when the Messiah came and Jesus came and fulfilled all 300 plus specific detailed prophecies about him completely. 300 were fulfilled. So now you go, hmm, I wonder if all of the prophecies, hmm, in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I wonder if the second coming prophecies will come into fulfillment. I wonder if Jesus really will crack the eastern sky and come in blazing glory on the Mount of Olives and then begin to set up his kingdom physically. He started to set his kingdom up spiritually here on earth because he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he began to, the king began to enter the hearts of people and he saved us, which is our greatest need, our spiritual need. We are desperately lost and on our way to hell without Jesus. And he saves us spiritually. But he is coming back again to restore all things and to deal with the hateful uh, people, the violent people dictators who commit genocide and people who hate and murder one another. Jesus is going to put an end to evil and he will establish his everlasting kingdom here on the earth. It is written, so shall it be. How many of you believe that Christ is coming back again? Can I get a witness? Absolutely he is. He came. He came and he's coming back again. Now here's something I want to teach you a theological term. Are you ready? You ready for this? Jesus, uh, the Old Testament, and he, the Old Testament prophets did this thing. When they prophesied, their prophecies, you have to understand there was dual fulfillment. Say that with me, dual fulfillment. So that it's, it's kind of like they would speak maybe in one paragraph or a verse or two verses, and it would describe the entire the two advents of Jesus all in one chunk. So when you get confused reading it, you say, wait, wait, wait. 
This prophecy, Jesus fulfilled when he first came, but he didn't do the rest. The rest is he's, he's going to bring when he returns, okay? So you might find in one specific text a scripture that speaks about him coming, uh, what his ministry would be here on earth, but then it would talk about, so like he comes as a suffering servant, but then it speaks about him coming as, coming as a conquering king, right? And sometimes his uh, prophecies about his ministry would be then followed up by his prophecy of his, of his powerful judgment. So here's what I want to tell you. It's kind of like, have you ever been in your car and you're driving, say, to Colorado or to the White Mountains, and off in the distance you see this big mountainous peak? You with me? And you're driving, and the closer you closer, you think it's just one mountain. And the closer you get, the more visible it becomes. You realize it's not just one mountain peak, it's a mountain range. So maybe when you see the first mountain, you look and maybe there's a big valley, a distant a, a valley that distances those mountains that you thought were together, but there's a distance and there's another mountain the closer you get. You see, that's what the prophets saw. They saw the mountain range. They didn't know that there was a first advent and then a second advent. But now we know. In fact, when the New Testament writers, when they saw the, de the, the life of Christ, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ and the ascension, it all dawned on them, aha, this part speaks about his first advent and now he said he's coming again. His second advent, he will come back again. By the way, do you know that Jewish scholars, those who are not Christian, they actually believe that there'll be two messiahs because of the description, like say in Isaiah 53, about the suffering servant who would come. That speaks of his dying on the cross. But then later, like passages like this, we've got a mighty, powerful Jesus. You know, we all see him as meek and mild, and Jesus, you know, he's white with blue eyes, and he's got flowing blonde hair. And we think, oh, he's just so tender. And No, he's coming back as a mighty. By the way, that, that's a bad depiction because he's Jewish. So he probably had brown hair, brown eyes, dark complexion, you know. So then he's coming back as a mighty warrior king. Because how, are we just okay with going on with injustice and hatred and North Korea letting, as he builds up a military, letting his own people die of starvation? We're, God's not okay with that. So while we wait patiently, we hold on to the king who will reconcile all things. He came and he's coming again. Everybody say he came. Now he's coming again. I want to talk about that. I'm just going to give you a few verses. The Bible is loaded with verses about the, com the second coming of Christ. So if he's fulfilled the first coming, how many of you know he will fulfill the next? Here's some passages just to give you a little sample. And I, I think the, uh, the media team will keep up with these. I'll give Acts 1 and Zechariah 14 and Matthew 24. Let's look at Acts 1.11. After Jesus ascended into heaven... The angels declared to the apostles, there's some angels, Janelle, talking to people. The angels declared to the apostles, men of Galilee, they said, why? Now, get the picture. Jesus now, he just gave him a, a commission, and now he's going up. Imagine this. You see Jesus, you spent three and a half years with him, and now he goes up and up and up. And so the angels, what do they say? They say, uh, they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? That's kind of a funny question. What would you do if you saw Jesus floating up into heaven? Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him gone into heaven. Have you ever had a dream about the coming of Christ? Where's Seth? Is Seth here? Is he teaching next door? He's teaching next door to the kids. My son has the most unbelievably apocalyptic second coming dreams I've ever seen. And he wakes up and he's like, Dad, Jesus is definitely coming back. You wouldn't believe the dream. You know, and uh, I, I love his, but I've had some like that. I've had some dreams. 
And, and sometimes it's the scripture and sometimes God will maybe allow a dream to come into your mind because we can't go on, Janelle, doing life as we think normally. We have to anticipate his coming because he, and by the way, the, the political alignment of things, the way the world and the Arab world is treating Israel, Israel is the key for prophecy because the way that things are aligning, the enemies of Israel, it's all, all of it is coming together so that <clears throat> there's so many nations that want to destroy and eliminate Israel and that's kind of the, the centrality of, of prophecy but it's that the moment when it looks like Israel is going to be, they're going to be gone off the face of the planet that Jesus shows up. So there's a lot um, of things, and that's in his second coming. So here's, he says uh, he's going to come back the same way. Zechariah 14.4 identifies the location of the second coming as the Mount of Olives. Do we have some of this? On that day, this is the Old Testament, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half. So Jesus is gonna, that's where he's gonna come. When all of the enemies, the armies are surrounding Jerusalem, Jesus will come. Matthew 24, 30 declares, at that time, the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Can I ask you a question? How many of you believe that Jesus is a good teacher? How many believe that his teachings are true? Can you count on them? Is this true? Is this going to happen? How then shall we live? Because I don't think there's anything in the way of the coming of Christ, at least in the form of the rapture. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 describes the second coming of Christ. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. What we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Lord Jesus, as his glorious appearing. And then... Um, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Are you ready for this one? Just forget about the cold. Just pretend it's warm. Okay? Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw, this is John, John, the apostle John, who God peels back um, the veil of the future of the coming, and he gets to see what it's going to look like. Listen to this description. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God, capital W. The armies of heaven were following him. By the way, I believe that seven years prior to this, before the great seven years of tribulation, that God is going to bring the saints of God up with him. And that's, that's how we get to go back with him because he says um, uh, the armies of heaven were following him. So the saints of God that have gone on will come riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. linen. That means Christ has made us righteous by his blood. So we're pure in Christ, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Whoa! Is that a powerful description of God, Jesus? No. Not really. Come on, church. Come alive. Is that a powerful description of Jesus or what? So, we need, to, uh, we need to anticipate because he came and he is coming again. And just from my own heart, my own kind of study of scripture, I've been in scripture for uh, 40 years or so. And I've studied, I studied the prophets, I've studied Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation. And we went through the book of Revelation, it took us over a year. 
So from what I've learned is that I think that the world has lined up chronologically to where things are put, being put in place the way that the prophets said they would. And it's absolutely stunning to read the news and to see how God is aligning things. He's moving toward, the, the revelation will tell you that there will be a one world government, a one world financial system. Pretty soon we're not gonna even need cash. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, a one world religion. Listen, there is, there is, it's moving toward less and less tolerance for Christianity, right? And so that paves the way for a one world religion and, and a one world leader, which will be called the Antichrist. Do you know that the, uh, do you know that, uh, do I want to go down this road, Neil? Um, <laughs> the, what's it called? The United Nations. The, uh, uh, anyways, there, there's, a, there's a plan to section off the world into 10 regions already in the books. It's already there. You can actually go on the website and see that. And so that it lines up with what um, the, the, you know, it tells us in the Bible that the Antichrist will rule from having 10 kings under him, the whole world. And so I can't develop that right now. I'll just give a little teaser. You can read this stuff and connect it to current events and it'll blow your mind. If you're not, if you don't have an anticipation and a readiness, then you're, you, you know, Jesus warned us. The ten virgins that went and, they, and the five didn't fill up their oil, they weren't anticipating, they weren't ready for the, when the bridegroom came. They couldn't go into the wedding. And so that's a severe warning. Be ready. Be ready for his coming. Get your house in order. Get your family life in order. Because the time is drawing near. Again, we could preach on this for a year, but I'm just giving you some simple things. Okay, his coming is good news and bad news. Point two. Malachi basically asks this question. Who can endure his coming? So the people are looking at everyone else and they're going, where's the God of justice? And God answers, you ready? Who among you can endure his coming? In other words, do you really want the God of justice to come? Could you survive the justice of God personally? Oh, that's a real, like, in other words, I, I notice in our world that, I notice that there's a, a new form of self-righteousness that's not based upon the Bible. It's based upon your own world, our own particular ideals and worldviews that certain things are now to some people sinful when actually those things that our culture is looking at as, as evil and sinful are actually what God has declared as righteous. Justice is falling in the streets. Truth is turned around backwards. That's predicted too in Isaiah, right? Or Jeremiah? Jeremiah or Isaiah, truth has turned way back. Uh, justice has fallen in the streets, right? So it's a complete perversion of what God says is right, the culture saying wrong. And what God says is wrong, the culture saying is right. And that was part of the prophetic thing. So it's important to know your Bible because you, be, you could be caught unaware. Who could, now, so the Malachi, the prophet says, who could stand at his coming? Who could stand his justice? Who can stand? Who can take it? The point is that none of us carry a complete righteousness in us without Jesus. In other words, we are flawed at some point or many points where none of us can point fingers. That's why Jesus, when they were judging the woman of adultery, Jesus called them out by writing in the sand. They all dropped their, their rocks. They couldn't judge her. So none of us could stand the judgment of God except for this good news. Jesus came on the cross to receive judgment for our sins. And so that whoever trusts in the work of the cross, they no longer have to fear the future judgment and wrath of God. So when Christ comes in his fury to judge the wicked, he, we will survive and we will be his glorious saints set apart for him. And it's all because of faith in Christ. But those who say, eh, 
You know, like where Janelle was at? Eh, I don't need Jesus. That's for old people. I'll just wait just before I die. As soon as I, I know I'm about to die, I'll say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. The problem is Rosa didn't know the moment that her death would come. You don't know. And why would we trade in a life with Christ for a life of what we think the pleasures of this world can bring? They're, they're not better. They're far, yeah, amen is right. Mike, we celebrate you today. I honor you. We celebrate a man who used to sneer at and mock the ways of Christians and the things of God, but now I don't know how many birthdays you've had as a believer. Ten birthdays as a believer, and he wouldn't trade it for the world. Amen? So if you're angry at God for somebody, uh, for not judging other people, you can't stand either except for Jesus. Um, the original audience here, uh, they couldn't stand either. So, uh, but we're good at taking out splinters out of other people's eyes when we have logs in our own. So be careful that you don't grow apathetic because of the injustice of others that you become, you, you, you wind up in the same place, right? Um, we can only stand when Messiah comes if we put our faith. And my question is, have you put your faith in Christ? Because you can look at the future joyfully with a, as an assurance to know that you are on his team, on the winning side. How many of you know to be a believer, you already know Christ wins, right? No matter what the future holds, you already know that Christ wins. Um, so the good news is this. The good news for every believer, you can follow it here. What's the good news for every believer? Here's the good news. God's going to bring a new covenant. Caleb read it. I mean, uh, Malachi prophesied a new covenant. Jesus is the new covenant. He says, I'll put, the Holy Spirit will put God's law on your hearts, and we will internally delight to do the work of God. We will want to please God. That's what, the, that's what a Christian express experiences the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Uh, he says that when the Messiah comes, he will refine and purify. I spoke recently that when the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus said uh, that, uh, or John the Baptist said that Christ will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The fire is a good thing because it's a refining process. So that means trials are good. Difficult times are good because as Janelle showed us, her greatest trial was a refining process in her life. And so he scrubs us with, with the soap, right? Which means that Jesus is like, he washes us clean so that we have no filth left. In Christ, we are clean and spotless because of what he's done. And then uh, next week, I'll talk about the blessing of the Lord. He blesses us. Uh, he makes us his treasure. Did you, did you hear when Caleb says, uh, he read it, where Malachi says that God was looking to, he watched those who fellowshiped and talked about the Lord together. And there was a scroll of remembrance written about them. In other words, your communication, your life revolves around this beautiful word of God that we fellowship around, right? And, and he said of them that God would make them his treasure. And then I love the picture of where he says, when the Messiah comes, this is when Jesus came the first time, the son of righteousness will rise. That's like a new day dawning. Jesus is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. He's a great healer. He heals you emotionally. He'll hear, by the way, Janelle was not only healed physically, her left leg, the doctor said, you'll never walk normally again. First they said, you'll never walk. And then they said, you'll never walk normally. Oh yeah? Well, how about, how about the Lord healed her and she walks fine now, even in four inch heels, right, Janelle? Right, you can walk great in four inch heels. You talked about that last night. Um, but listen, not only did, does he heal physically, but she was healed emotionally. I, I would say under most conditions, you probably should have been labeled with PTSD. But you know what? She said, I didn't have any of those fears. I can go into a city. In fact, right now, she works in a high rise building. She goes to work every day in the what floor? 15th? In a 15th floor. She's not afraid what could come because she's been healed. And that's who Christ is. He's your healer. He heals and he releases you into freedom. In other words, he says it's like a calf being led out of a stall. The calf has been in prison to a stall and he's been released and he has freedom. Now watch this. 
This is, this is what we have to be careful of. What will he do to unbelievers when Christ comes back? To those who reject his love, to those who reject his grace, there's, no, there's nothing good in store for anyone who rejects Christ. He will testify against them. He talks about their sorcery, their adultery, the way they treat foreigners and strangers and injustice. He will testify against them. Chapter 3 talks about a curse that is on those who refuse to follow the Lord. There's a fiery judgment that awaits, even to the point of reducing to ashes and an annihilation of anyone who, dis who chooses not. That's why Jesus said, I've come to give life more abundantly. For God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the opposite of everlasting life. One more slide. How should we prepare? Return to God. Fear and honor God. Trust God. Be generous with your life. Speak his word to each other. Get in a place where you're in a life group. You continue to stay committed to coming to church. Get one-on-one -on -one with people. Open the word. Talk about it. What does it mean to our life? Turn your hearts to generations. He says, before he comes, this happened the first time, and I believe it'll happen the second time. Men, you ready for this? By the way, get involved with men's fraternity, men. Dick, can you stand up real quick? Is Larry in the room? This guy and La his buddy Larry, the two dudes, remember Larry with the cool glasses, like men in black kind of thing. Anyways, uh, those guys lead an amazing men's group. Get signed up on the back table. But he says this, what's going to happen is there'll be a movement where fatherlessness is not going to be acceptable anymore, where the, men, the, the hearts of the fathers are going to turn to the children and the generations are going to look to each other and they're going to need each other and they're going to love each other. And I believe God is doing that. Um, so anyways, those are the things. Get prepared. Watch and wait. Jesus said, don't let that day take you as a surprise. Don't let that day take you as a surprise. He says, watch and pray. Be mindful. Give attention to. Be awake to the fact that he's coming again.